Okay, let's get started. All right, limiting reactant. Uh, one of the most common questions from quantitative chemistry that Cambridge uses is about limiting an excess reactant. So if I begin with limiting reactant, sometimes they use the word limiting reactant, sometimes they use the word limiting reagent. It almost means the same thing and can be defined in the similar way. Uh, limiting reactant is a reactant that is present usually in less amount and it finishes up earlier in a reaction and what happens when it finishes up earlier in a reaction it tends to stop the reaction so that's exactly what happens, stop the reaction. And thus, it controls the yield or the amount of product produced. Yield means the same thing. So it tends to finish this up earlier. Right, so it must be easy to then explain the opposite, which is excess reactant. A reactant that is usually present. in or amount and some of it that actually is that unreacted by the end of the reaction. So that's the basic way we define limiting and excess reactants. And that gives us the general idea, all right? You get the general idea, right? Come up with a basic example. Let's say that you uh, think about a party at your home. And let's say that you uh, invite your class fellows and then to just to give it a personal touch, although with most of the parties we tend to order stuff from outside, you tend to make some sandwiches by your own. And when you do that, in order to complete the whole task, making sandwiches for your own friends, you go out to the market and you buy one loaf bread, all right? And when you buy that one loaf of bread, it actually consists of 30 slices. You count those slices and they turn out to be 30 slices. You also go ahead and you <laughs> buy uh, one packet of patties, right? That's commonly we go with a slice up top, a slice at the bottom, a patty in between. That's the most common way of coming up with a sandwich, right? So that one packet of patties consists of 14 patties, actually. You counted those two. And then you go ahead and you buy a packet of ketchup sachets. Let's say. And let's say that one packet consists of 15 sachets, right? Your uh, formula is for one sandwich is actually, or your idea of one sandwich is to use 
two slices plus one patty per sandwich plus one sachet of ketchup. And that's the simplest way you can go for a sandwich. And you think of that way. Now, tell me how many sandwiches would you be able to make? Um, from the 30 slot, um, this would be. Remember, this is the recipe of a single sandwich. And if you combine all of your ingredients, my question is that in reality, we're not talking about theoretically. In reality, how many sandwiches would you be able to make? So considering all three ingredients for your recipe, what is your answer going to be? You may use calculator, you may use a piece of paper, you may write it up, it's completely fine, whatever you'd like to use. So would it be 16? Okay, uh, your answer is 16. I'm gonna note down an answer and to me, more than your answer, what's important is your approach towards it. Now, you may start your calculation from any of the ingredients. So be honest with me when you answer your questions for me, from which ingredient do you started your calculation with? Because you can either start it with slices or with patties or with sachets. I don't know, different students tend to perform this calculation from different start. So which one did you start with? Oh, sir, my internet. See, I'm 16. And um, sir, I used uh, the slices because um, they're the foundation, I guess, because every right. sandwich would consist of two slices. So um, I just multiplied two or 30. Actually, you divided 30 by two. Um, yeah, 30 by two. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, 15, 15. 15, yeah. 15. So from, and I'm going to actually uh, try different approaches to give you the idea. So when you try to go with the number of slices, it tells you that you would be able to make 15 sandwiches. All right. Now, what I want you to do, and the basic purpose of why I ask you this question is that I need some changes to your approaches. And we're gonna try different approaches just to understand what limiting reactant is, because that is what's required by the question. You tend to go for one single approach and you may be right or wrong with it. Trying different approaches give you the idea which approach is correct. So let's approach the same question from the point of view of patties. So with the number of patties given, how many sandwiches would you be able to make? This time, don't work out with slices. Leave the slices alone. Don't even think about them. Just ignore them. Just ignore the sachets. Just ignore the slices. Just think about the patties. So with the number of patties given, how many sandwiches would you be able to make? Sure. And since you have amended your answer to 15, so I'm going to write 15. Okay, 14 sandwiches. Great. So again, let's ignore slices and patties this time, and let's keep our approach in terms of the ketchup sachets. So uh, with the number of sachets given, how many sandwiches would you be able to make? 15. 15. Now, these are two different answers coming up. Either the correct answer can be 15 or the correct answer can be 14. Means either this, this approach for slices and sachets can be right or the approach for patties can be right. Which one in reality do you think is correct? Sir, we used a common one, which is 15. So will you be able to make 15 sandwiches? In reality, think about reality. 
would you be able to make 15 complete sandwiches? Uh, no, sir. Like 14. Uh, no, sir. And why not 15? Great. Your answer is completely correct. Now, let's contemplate and answer this question. Why not 15? Why 14? And you're right. 15 is not correct answer. 14 is actually the correct answer. In reality, you would only be able to make 14 sandwiches. But why not the 15th one? Because sir, there is one. Uh, because uh, one of the essential ingredients gives us a different answer, I guess. And uh, right, without perfect that... answer. One of the essential ingredients, which is a patty, is missing for the 15 sandwiches. Yeah, you have those two slices. You have the sachet of the ketchup to work it out, but the main ingredient, which is going to go between those two slices, is missing, right? So you will end up forming 15, 14 sandwiches, and that's actually um, the correct answer. This one. We can still work up. We can still work up. I can make a sandwich with ketchup and give it to my least uh, friend that I <laughs> don't really like. <laughs> yeah, that's the common approach students tend to come up with, or they say that we can be a little bit sacrificial and we're going to eat it ourselves and uh, give the good ones to our guests. There are different approaches for students, but let's not discuss that because in science, we're talking about limiting reactions. We're not talking about <laughs> some revenges over the acquaintances instead of good friends. Okay. So let's stick to the topic. Well, I loved your answer, by the way, and I love the honesty, but let's stick to the topic. So the point I'm trying to make over here is that 15 for sandwiches in terms of slices, and I'm going to encircle this one and this one, they are actually excessive reactions. They are present in excess. They are the ones that are left at the end of the process because uh, some of them are unused at the end of the process because they were present in excess. And this definitely gives us the idea that the patties are the limiting reactants. And remember, since I'm using the word reactant, so we can never talk about a product in this case. So fatty is the limiting reactant, ketchup sachets and slices are actually excess reactants. Now, Another question that Cambridge usually poses right after this one is that how many excess reactants in the number or amounts are you left with unreacted? After you're done making 14 sandwiches, what are you left with in terms of excess stuff? How many slices and how many fat Sir, I'll be left with um, two slices, I guess, and... Uh... Two oh. Your voice was breaking. I was able to hear two slices, but not anything afterwards. Uh, so you said two, you will be left with two slices and what? There are two packets, I guess. Uh, how come? You're making 14 sandwiches, you're using... 14 sachets, how will you be left with two sachets? Come on, think about it. Yeah, one, one sachet, yeah, yeah. Right, right, you'll be left with just one sachet and you will be left with two slices of bread. That's what it is in excess. Now, how were you able to calculate your leftovers for excess? You actually were able to calculate it in such a way that you knew for 14 sandwiches, you are going to require 14 into 2, 28 slices, right? Or you're going to require 14 sachets. So you knew what you have consumed. And when you worked out like this, total number of slices minus consumed number of slices, you were able to come up with two slices that were in excess. Again, you had 15 sachets. You consumed 14 out of them, and you are left with one sachet at the end as an excess, right? So that's how you were able to do it. it this is the calculation that you did at the back of your mind, that this much as I'm using and this much what would be left after a little bit of subtraction. Am I right? Yes, sir. 
great. So that's what we are going to do in chemistry as well. This whole idea was to tell you that we tend to calculate our limitings and our excesses uh, in our daily life, and we do it all the time. We, knew, and we know that if we're going to come up with a recipe for anything, and it's not just the eatables that I'm talking about, we tend to do it with our money in pocket, we tend to do it with the stuff we commonly use, the consumables in our daily life. Uh, we know that we might be dealing with some limiting stuff or some excess stuff, and uh, when we write down the things, we know that we need to go out and we need to buy them again. And since our, many of our consumables are fast moving consumer goods, they finish up after a specific amount of time. Uh, toiletries, for example, the soaps and shampoos we commonly use are one of those things. So yeah, we understand that we deal with limiting and excess stuff all the time. And we tend to go to the market back again, we purchase them, we restock them and we, re, we use them again. And that's how the life goes. So we tend to keep this calculation as a part of your, our life. So this calculation in chemistry is also going to be in the same way. Now, the point I am about to make, and that is a very important one. Sometimes for a specific number of things that you are going with, some of them are in excess, some of them are limiting. Remember the calculation with limiting turn out to be correct every time and the calculation for excess may not take you to the right answers. Keep in mind when we're talking about loaf of bread and slices, we knew that we can make 15 sandwiches, but we weren't actually able to make 15 sandwiches. We were only able to make 14. So any calculation in terms of limiting reactions are going to be correct. And we, if we can keep our perception limited to just the excess calculation or excess reactant-based calculation, our perception might lead us towards wrong answers. This is the first point I'm making, and we're gonna do the same in upcoming questions. So keep that in mind that any of the calculations done in respect of the limiting reaction kept in mind or perception, you're gonna lead towards the right answers. And if you're gonna work your way with the help of excess reactants, you might end up with uh, going some correct answers in theory, but in reality, you won't be able to fulfill them up. Or you might have to go with the uh, least favored friends or <laughs> the acquaintances in order to come up with the solution for that, all right? So since we are working with math, that's not gonna work out for us. So keep this point in mind. Also, at the end of the day, we might need to calculate the excess stuff left unreacted, which is one of the most common questions Cambridge, Cambridge asks you as soon as they are done by asking the most common question, identify the limiting reactant or the excess reactant in a reaction, okay? Yeah. So uh, apart from this, I hope you already also understand that the questions for limiting and excess reactant will give you all the information about the reactant. They won't hide anything. Like previously, we used to talk about one reactant at a time and the other one was unknown, like we did back in the acid-based titration, one of the concentration for either the acid or the ugly was given, and the other one was for you to find out. This is not gonna happen in excess and limiting reaction questions. In excess and limiting reaction questions, you will be faced with all the details of the reaction, so you can actually calculate and identify which one of them is excess, which one of them is limiting, and from there on onward, you can carry on with the examiner's question. I hope I have made a couple of points clear, and now we can jump on to the practice question. Can we? Yes, sir. Just a question uh, I have, sir, uh, is that sir, since these questions are usually um, pretty clear and we don't really have to find a lot of stuff in it, uh, what would be the marks that would contain these types of questions? These types of questions are usually uh, higher in terms of their marks as to the, the other counterparts that we have previously did. Like uh, we have done percentage purity questions or percentage yield questions or maybe acid-based titration questions. So if I rank all of the types, usually percentage yield and limiting reactant are the type of questions that have the highest marks, anywhere from three marks to six marks. 
anywhere in between those. Usually the simpler questions like percentage purity tends to be just one or two marks each. So they tend to be the smaller ones in terms of marks. These are more important and they also tend to have more marks. Then not gonna be as simple as we presume them to be. They're a little bit confusing, but yeah, we'll go with a few questions to understand that point, okay? And I'm gonna show you the questions right after this one so you'd understand what I'm talking about, okay? Just let me pull up the questions for you. Go ahead. Now go through the starting part of the question, read it out, and then let me know, are you able to comprehend the basics. Remember, it's similar to the titration questions that we were doing. So basically, well, you are about to use the molar concentration formula that we have previously used. Okay, go ahead, read the first two or three lines up till part one, and then let me know would you be able to solve it? Okay, At least sir. the part one. Okay, so for sulfuric acid, we had 20 cubic centimeter of the acid and the concentration was 0 0.3 mole per decimeter cube. So I hoped that you use the formula that moles is equal to concentration multiplied by volume. And since the volume is in cubic centimeter, we need to divide it by 1000 to convert it into decimeter cube. And this would be then 0 0.30 multiplied by 20, and that 20 is to be divided by 1,000. So have you done it the similar way? If not, yes, sir. Uh, initially, this way and tell me the answer. Yes, sir, I did it this way. Initially, sir, I kind of mixed up, and uh, I used a concentration of uh, sodium hydroxide, but I realized my mistake. And yeah, the answer is... Um, it is just like an I guess six multiplied by 10 to the power of minus three. Right. So since to put it into three significant figures, so I'm going to convert it into 6.00 multiplied by 10 raised to the power of minus three. And the unit would be mole since the units are not written over here. So we are supposed to write it. And we're going to use the same formula for any OH. And since that, 40 cubic centimeter in volume in 0.2 mole per decimeter cube. So that would be 0 0.20 multiplied by 40 and divided by 1000. So the answer to this one is, I guess this one is 8.00 into 10 raised to the power minus 3 mole. Please confirm whether I've done it correct or not. Well, I guess this is right. Um, sir, I'm kind of confused um, with the wording here, sir, because the questions that we previously did, uh, if I remember correctly, sir, the first question used uh, the word reacted, I think, and then we had to use the content that was given. And the second question um, usually had the word produced in it. Yeah, uh, that's and, the point uh, I was talking it was about different... before I came to the question. Remember, yeah, before sir, we started off oh, with the questions, I um, told you, yeah, go ahead. because we're doing the same method twice. Okay, I got your point. Now, let me explain. Before I started off with the example question, uh, back when I was telling you that this time, the questions are gonna be a little bit different and the questions are going to cater all the information about the reactants. They're not gonna keep it hidden. That's where we know it's an excess reactant question. Well. If you read out the parts of this excess, you get to know, yeah, this is a, an excess limiting reactant question. But from this statement, it's pretty much clear. 
all the information for first reactant is given, all the information for the second reactant is given, and both the parts tend to ask you the same question about both the reactants. So yeah, this one is different from all the previous questions we have done. Yeah, we would tend to go with the formula part first, ratio part second, and then again the formula part in the last step, but this one's different. In this one, we actually tend to find out the information about the reactant first, and we do that for both the reactants. The first two steps are exactly similar to one another. Um, they can be different, but still, let me tell you, both the first two steps are usually the formula step in this question. Why? Because we need to find the information about both the reactants why? Because we need to identify one of them as limiting and the other one as excess reactant. And that is the way we will be able to understand that the perception of the limiting reactant for the further steps of the question, for the third step, fourth step, or whatever number of steps there are, would be correct. And for that of excess reactant perception might lead us towards wrong answers. That's why we are going with this kind of work. I hope it makes clear for you, right? The way we are doing questions so is different from the previous one because it is the requirement of the question itself. So the main point is that uh, we just have to find what type of question it is. And if it's excess, then uh, it has it has a particular type of characteristic, with, which is two questions that would be same uh, usually. Like, uh, right. Right, okay. you get the point now, I, I, and that's great. When the students start identify the type of question they are facing, they understand the type of strategy they are going to use to solve that question. Now the strategy for percentage yield and the strategy for limiting reaction question are completely different. Now the percentage yield question was a four part question, formula in the first part, ratio in the second part, formula in the third part, and finally the yield calculation in the fourth part. But that's not how this question goes. This one's different. We use the formula in the first two steps instead of using the ratio. But the upcoming steps will always, of course, you are going to use the ratio. So the strategy is a little bit different for different kind of questions. And that's why when you start reading the statement, it's better to understand what the statement consists of and what kind of question it is going to lead you to. Make sense? Yes, sir. And remember, there are always identifiers in the question. For example, if not the first two lines, this one is a big identifier. This question is definitely about excess and limiting reactant. Now, the word yield, and I'm going to take you to a question. Now, since we are at it, I think quoting a couple of examples from previous questions is going to give you a very good idea. <clears throat> Okay, take a look at this question. Now, a clear identifier is here. Now you know what kind of question that is, right? As soon as you see this, so this you make up your mind it's a percentage yield question and step one, step two, step three, step four. Yeah, there are four steps that we have been discussing above. So the, this probably is a formula step. This probably is a ratio step. This probably is a formula step. And finally, the yield calculation would be done in the fourth and the final step. Make sense? Yes, sir. But, but, but this brings us to our point for our today's topic, which is actually different and which doesn't work in the same way. Yeah, we have been working in the same way, but not for limiting reaction questions anymore. Right? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna just write our answers. So this one was 6.00 in 10 raised to power minus three moles. You already remember the formula I used. And this one was 8.00 into 10 raised to power minus three moles. Now, if so far you're there with the first two parts, we're gonna move to the next. Can we? Yes, sir. Great. Okay, before we move on to the next part, I am gonna uh, 
uh, actually explain a little bit of some previous backend calculations that you're going to make before you go with writing of the answer in the next part. Usually, they in the next part, they tend to ask you uh, whether identify which one is the excess reactant or reagent or which one is the limiting reactant or reagent. And as you can see the same question in the third part. So yeah, that makes total sense that they are going to ask you to identify uh, either one of the reactants and what type they are. Now, before we move on to that one, there is something you need to know. Limiting reactant. And I'm gonna use, let's, Let's put up some keys for us over here. So when I use the abbreviations, you don't have a problem of understanding those abbreviations. So I'm gonna put it a limiting reactant as LR in the rest of my questions and excess reactant as ER, right? This is gonna make the whole thing easier for us. So LR produces least number of moles of product. This is the key to knowing or identifying the limiting reactant. And of course, if one of them is limiting reactant, the other one must be in excess. Or in most of the cases, these questions tend to be, so it would be easier for you to understand. So keep this hint in mind. What this brings to is that what you are supposed to do is a stepwise calculation. Either one of these reactants, either the NOH or the H2SO4 can be a limiting reactant. One of these would be limiting, the other one would obviously be excess. And there are two products, NH2SO4, H2O. Now, you need to compare both of these reactants with the same product that you choose, okay? So this is actually gonna be a two-part step. So we need to take uh, NaOH in ratio with one product, let's say I pick Na2SO4. Let's say for the sake of understanding, you can pick Na2SO4, you can pick H2O, it's entirely up to you. It does not matter which one you pick, but the step I'm about to do has to be symmetric, means both the reactants are supposed to work against the same product. It can't be that you take NaOH against H2O and H2SO4 against Na2SO4 that would be unsymmetric. And that way you're gonna make a mistake, all right? I hope I have made my point clear. Sir, I'm sorry, but I wasn't able to properly hear you. Uh, it's kind of, uh, could you repeat, sir, the hint? The hint was you need to take ratio of both the reactants with the same product. So see, I've used Na2SO4. You can pick any of one of the products and they're entirely up to you. You can pick H2O, that's fine. but. H2O would be compared with both the reactants or Na2SO4 is supposed to be compared with both the reactants. Now you know already know the ratio step, right? If I solve with the help of NaOH, two moles of NaOH produce one mole of Na2SO4. There we go. If I talk about H2SO4, one mole of H2SO4 produces one mole of Na, Na2SO4, right? NaOH, as given over here, is 8 into 10 raised to the power minus 3. I'm going to solve it with respect to x. And H2SO4, as given over here, is 6 into 10 raised to the power minus 3. I'm also going to solve it for x. Clearly, the x over here is 6 into 10 raised to the power minus 3. And here, the x is supposed to be 8 multiplied by 10 raised to the power minus 3 over 2. The answer comes out to be 4 into 10 raised to the power minus 3. All right. So this produces 4 moles of product. This produces 6 moles of product multiplied by 10 raised to the power minus 3. So do you understand this part? I'm actually solving ratio side by side for both the reactants for the same product. Get the point? Uh, yes, sir. So, sir, the reagent uh, in excess 4.10 to 3? 
Yeah, this one is less amount. So any OH is limiting reagent. This one produces more amount of product, but this one is this reactant. And actually this is the rule that leads us towards our answer. I've already stated limiting reaction produces least number of moles of product. Make sense? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, what does ER stand for? Excess reactant. I wrote it over here on the extreme top left side. LR stands for limiting reactant, ER stands for excess reactant, which means that this in this reaction, NaOH is going to finish up earlier. And since NaOH is finished up, the whole reaction would stop. And there would still be some of the H2SO4 amount left unreacted. Like in our previous example, the fatties were limiting reactants, so they finished up earlier. In a similar way, in this question, NaOH is like fatties. They finish up earlier. Right? But H2SO4 is excess reactant. And like the previous example, H2SO4 are like slices of the bread or like the ketchup sachets, which are present in excess amount. And even when the reaction is completely finished up, some of its amount could be left unreacted. There you go. As soon as we identify the limiting index, this reactant, remember, the one produces lesser amount, has a smaller answer, is the limiting reactant. The one produces a bigger answer, is the excess reactant. You can simply write H2SO4 over here. Instead, I should do it in red. Same colors. So H2SO4. Make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> now comes the next step, reason. We tend to reason it with the amount of excess reactant left unreacted. So let's discuss that. So first of all, we need to know the actual amount of uh, excess reactant used. So what we tend to do right after this step is that we keep both the reactant, the limiting reactant on left, excess reactant on right, since this one is NaOH, it comes on left. This one is H2SO4, it comes on right. For two moles of NaOH, as per the balanced chemical equation, we require one mole of H2SO4, and we're gonna use this answer over here. Sorry, not this one, my bad. Uh, this answer over here, since all of the NOH would be used, so 8 into 10 raised to the power minus 3, so how much of the H2SO4 would be used? So X is 8 into 10 raised to the power minus 3 over 2 is equal to 4 into 10 raised to the power minus 3. So notice, 4 into 10 to the power minus 3 moles of H2SO4 is used, although there were 6 into power 10 to the power minus 3. Total present. Actually, I should mention total H2SO4 present is equal to 6 into 10 to the power minus 3. I, your voice is breaking up. I, I, I'm having a hard time understanding you. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah, I can hear you now. Is it all? Okay. 
So total amount present is equal to 6 into 10 raised to the power minus 3. Consumed amount is 4 into 10 raised to the power minus 3, which we just calculated. So left unreacted is equal to 6 multiplied by 10 raised to the power minus 3 minus 4 multiplied by 10 raised to the power minus the answer would be 2 multiplied by 10 raised to the power minus 3 moles. And that's the reason why is it, in, it is in excess. That's the way you need to reason this question. You tell the examiner that you completely understand there were more number of moles of H2SO4 present. The consumed amount was less. When subtracting, you can tell the examiner that the amount left unreacted for H2SO4 was this much. And the examiner would understand that you completely understand the point of the whole question. All right? Okay, so now, as much as the limiting and excess reactants were pretty great questions in terms of sachets, ketchup, <laughs> burger, buns, and sandwiches, they were amusing and they were good to calculate easier to understand, they come as confusing questions when it comes to chemistry. Yeah, and they are. So that's fine if this question confuses you the first time, but keep the whole steps in mind. You calculate the number of moles for both the reactants as your first step, which is by the way, first and second step over there. Then for your own step, you Compare them both in a ratio question, both the reactants for a single product and the same single product. You find out uh, the identify the limiting and excess reactant. Then you take a ratio between both of them to find out the amount of excess reactant consumed. And then you go for a subtraction part to uh, find out the amount of excess reactant left than reacted. Make sense? If it doesn't make sense, don't worry. We can give another class to this type of questions, and this would make sure that you completely understand them. So what I'm going to leave you is with this solution and uh, one or two questions in, of the similar sort, and you can try them on your own. If you're still not able to do them, don't worry. We're going to do them together in the next setting. All right? Okay, sir. Great. Okay. So I think that's it for the today's question. I'm going to clear up the whole thing. Actually, I'm going to also take a picture of this and let's clear it up. Okay, let me see if we have any this reactant question. Yeah, that's great. This is, uh, it seems like a yield question, like in, but it's actually an excess question. And this question would uh, actually ask you to uh, solve the same step. Although there is a little bit of uh, technicality in there, but I hope you'll be able to do it. Yeah, this one is a good one. This one exactly is the same as the previous one. So up till, yeah, this C part, this I guess is page number nine. I'm right with the number of pages. This was seven to eight. And yeah, this is page number nine, part C on the top of the page. A great question for you to do. And then moving on. No, there aren't any. This one is also a limiting reactant question. So there are three more questions in this worksheet related to limiting reactants. But I would say that you try to go with the page number nine, part C, the question on the top of the page first. If you're good with it, they can, then you can try the other two questions. All right? Okay, sir. Um, so just another, uh, I have just one more question. 
Go ahead. Yeah, sir. What is your new? What was your New Year's resolutions? Resolutions, 